Someone in my organization used old and damaged axles on the engine. They'll know we have a killer on our payroll, and we need to make it clear it isn't me. I've just come from Mr. Fortune's office. He said my article has increased their circulation. I wish I could see what he's done wrong. Be warned, my dear. He won't need you much longer. I suppose you know my story. I broke the rules. I'm on the brink of breaking them myself. I heard today that Mr. McAllister wants to come here for luncheon. I think the fact that five men are dead is a little more important. This is too much! Agnes, don't do anything you'll regret! Heads have rolled for less. Ward McAllister was known as Mr. Society, being very charming and fun. Everybody would say the party doesn't really start until Mr. McAllister gets here. Mr. McAllister has confirmed that he's coming to Mrs. Fane's luncheon. Hallelujah. Let the trumpets sound. Ward McAllister was an extraordinary character, very central one. He was obsessed with the importance of society. He coined the phrase, the 400, which consisted of the people who were appropriate for the elite high society. There are these 400 families, and those are the ones invited to the Astor's Ball every year. And you're not anyone if you're not invited to that ball. And everybody knows it. And now lunch with Mr. McAllister will make your dreams come true? He's the gatekeeper, so yes, it could. And I will make it my business to see that it does. And he's a doorman to society of who can come in and who's going to be left out. Ward McAllister can see that not only is Bertha fun and gorgeous and have so much money, but there are certain families he knows are eventually going to break through and get in. And he wants to be a part of that. And you must be? Mrs. George Russell, may I present Mr. Ward McAllister? What a pleasure. Mr. McAllister. I think we learn about Bertha that most of the things she does are pretty calculated. I don't believe your guest list is quite what you would like it to be. And likewise, when she meets Ward McAllister, she makes a really bold choice to be completely transparent with him. And instead of dealing in these coded messages and these social customs, she just cuts the chase and says, I need your help. I'd love to think you would be my protector. On this day, I give thanks for the work of the Red Cross. Claire Barden really is all about her charity work and just getting money. And she doesn't care where the money comes from. She doesn't have to be in society. So she's talking to Marion about making these introductions. Do any of you know Mrs. Chamberlain? I've met her a few times. Could you interest her in my cause? Mrs. Chamberlain has a little dirt on her name, so there's all these subtle looks from Aurora, like, oh, Lord, this is going to mess up your whole life. <laughs> Isn't that the silliest thing in the world? That, that's what's so funny about this world. It's kind of the genius of Julian's writing that this woman's name is dirty, so you can't get money from her. I should be going. Not yet, surely. Yes, I should. You're a great girl. One of the best I've ever known or ever will know. I think that Gladys knows pretty quickly that the change in Archie towards her is most likely influenced by her parents, which is the challenge that Gladys has been struggling with this entire season. You haven't spoiled things, Father. Not for Mr. Bolt. You may be sure of that, my dear. Bertha's goals involve making a very specific kind of marriage for Gladys that will give Gladys the life that Bertha thinks she should have. And unfortunately, that can come out rather harshly. Where do you think you're going? Out. Get upstairs, take off your hat, and I will see you in the drawing room later. I think Bertha sometimes seems awfully critical of Gladys, but it really is, of course, like these things always are, rooted in love. You see, I think I love him. But don't you know what that means? I know what it means. I promise you this. I'll never ask anything of you that is not for your benefit in the end. And she really wants Gladys to occupy an important place in society. She wants her to marry up, even though they're ostensibly at the top of the chain right now. But socially, they still have a ways to go. You want more from me than I want for myself. That is my job. I am your mother. I want the whole world for you. And I'll get it any way I can. 
What happened during the Gilded Age is that we have this incredible economic stratification. But what that meant, of course, is that all of these populations were really struggling. My mother is in a really horrifically poor area. She's ill. And I go over there on my day off to take care of her. And she's incredibly cruel to me. Did you try the pie? It's over there if you want it. Oh, mother. We all don't like Armstrong at this point. She seems like a racist, she's catty, she's mean. But just like in real life, people are like that because things have happened to them, because there's damage in their life. You're pinching me. Now we can understand why she's so bitter and mean, because she's come from abuse. So it's a really tough scene. It was hard just imagining how Armstrong feels about going through that and then having to cover to be like everything was great. How was your day? Lovely. Thank you, Mrs. Bauer. It's heartbreaking, but also as a society, we haven't come that far from the political and social struggles uh, from that time period. While The Gilded Age is a period piece, at its core, these are stories about families who are trying to find their place in society as individuals and as a family unit. You're a lucky one, Miss Armstrong. And don't I know it? Oh yes, I'm the lucky one.